Hi, Wayne Dorban here for the bi-weekly NTP Seed webinar huddle that we hold here at our Northern Colorado headquarters in Loveland, Colorado, both live here at our site and also going out over the web to those of you that are watching. Enjoy what we have for you today. And we are so excited because today we've got Dr. Robert Howarth from the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Cornell University in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. So you're going to be hearing him today, and he'll be live, and we'll be able to answer questions if you have them. Um, but also, um, he's going to be mainly, you're going to see a PowerPoint presentation that uh, he has prepared for us, and then you're going to be seeing me uh, a little bit, and then we'll go from there. Um, just a little bit of an update. Um, it's been a wonderful last couple weeks here at the ranch. As you know, um, a little over a month ago, we transitioned from our warehouse up here to our ranch location. Uh, it's been a great month of transition as we get in our facilities here up to speed and, and uh, getting things uh, put in place. It took us actually a couple weeks to get our internet throughout our campus here. Obviously picture previously being in a 15,000 square foot building and now we're in a, a, a multi-acre, you know, hundreds of acres around us here ranch. And, and we're, we're communicating between offices that are in different locations on that. And we pretty much got that under control. Sometimes we can't control the, the distance sort of stuff like we're doing with Dr. Howarth here today. Um, Dr. Howarth, and again, um, uh, would you like me to call you Dr. Howarth or Bob, or how would you like me to? Oh, Bob, Bob is fine. Uh, right. I'm very happy to be with you today. Well, awesome. We appreciate that. Well, again, excited to have you with us today. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to have some questions, and then you're also going to sort of give us a presentation from a PowerPoint that you have. Um, you're going to see that, that Dr. Howarth or Bob's going to actually indicate to Leanne when, when he's ready to move on um, to another slide because he's not able to see right where we're at in the PowerPoint video. The audio signal is excellent, though, Bob. And um, I think our, our listeners are going to have a, just a wonderful time here today. So okay. um, let's just get right at it. Um, you know, I, I usually prepare a bunch of questions, and you've seen these. And, you know, if you could just maybe start out, tell us just a little bit about yourself, your current business and life situation. And then from that, you know, I'll probably expand in a couple of questions and then um, maybe ask you a little bit about your college years and so on. And then we'll, let, then we'll just go right into your PowerPoint. Okay, sure. Uh, you know, I'm a professor at, at Cornell. Uh, I've been on the faculty here for uh, 29 years. Uh, I'm an oceanographer by, by PhD level training, but I, I do a lot of research uh, generally in the area of earth system science and, and ecosystem biology. Uh, we have a nice large uh, lab group. I work uh, with my wife, Dr. Roxanne Marino, the co-lab organizer. Uh, we work on a lot of different topics, and the, the one I'd be most excited to explain in, in a little bit of detail with you today is some work we've done on uh, methane emissions and uh, how that makes the natural gas a pretty dangerous fuel from the standpoint of, of global change. But I also, uh, in the PowerPoint, put together some stuff from my uh, early years, going back to late high school, to sort of give you a sense of uh, how I developed into the type of scientist I am. Why don't we jump into that, and be before we do, just so you have a little context, it's kind of amazing how similar we're at. We're similar in age. Um, looks like you graduated uh, from college maybe in 73 or 74, graduate yeah. school after that. Well, I graduated in 73, University of California, Irvine, and went to Scripps right after that and at, in their marine program. Um, and and you, you, you're you going to go ahead and tell your story here, so why don't you go right into it. I, I didn't say where I went to college. I went to Amherst College. I was there for uh, 1970 to 74, and I've got a little bit of information about there. But before I went to Amherst, I, I grew up in a very small town in rural New Hampshire, a town of 600 people, fairly near the seacoast. So I uh, grew up loving the ocean and loving the rural environment. Uh, went to a Still pretty small, uh, regional high school. It covered multiple towns. It's my high school. Uh, there was no high school in my town. Uh, and towards uh, the end of my time in high school, my very last year, uh, 1970, uh, that was the very first Earth Day. And I was one of the statewide organizers for the very first Earth Day in New Hampshire. 
there's this fellow, William Loeb, who used to run the largest state newspaper in New Hampshire. And on Earth Day, he ran a front page editorial accusing me and four others by name as uh, being communists for having organized uh, Earth Day, which was a real eye opener. And the reason I, I mention that is that uh, I have always been an environmentalist, uh, or recently become a scientist, obviously. Uh, I started off as a fairly conservative person from that rural New Hampshire background. My parents were Republicans. I probably thought of myself as a Republican, but. Once you're all the communists because you believe in taking care of the environment, that's a, that's a real eye-opener. So it's a, caused me to start uh, thinking more broadly. While I was in college, Aristotle on Athos, who was a Greek shipping magnate and at the time one of the richest men in the world, uh, tried to put a offshore uh, oil unloading terminal off the coast of New Hampshire in a beautiful place called the Isles of Shoals, small island six miles off the coast, and I had spent a lot of my uh, time earlier years uh, on those islands and uh, camped out there and things, and I, I just thought this was a horrific idea that you'd turn that into an uh, industrial oil port. So I didn't personally get involved in that, but a lot of my friends who stayed home in New Hampshire, I was off at college in Massachusetts by then, uh, organized a... a action against it, and they were successful in closing it down. So that never happened. I'm happy to say those islands are protected now, and actually Cornell runs a marine lab on, on one of them. Beautiful place. After my uh, junior year in college, I uh, wasn't quite sure if I wanted to be a political science major or a biology major. I was interested in environment, but I didn't know if I wanted to be a scientist or a, a lawyer. But I got a chance to do an internship with uh, George Woodwell, who uh, at the time, I worked for Brookhaven National Lab. I, I worked with them on a salt marsh project for the summer of 1973. But uh, Woodwell was uh, one of the very first ecologists who was talking about the problems of climate change. He had written about it extensively already as of 1973, and talking about how deforestation in the Amazon, in addition to fossil fuel use, was a driver. And uh, uh, I, he, he did many things for me. He's been a role model for me ever since, basically world-class scientist who cared about real-world issues, got involved, believed that you should use your science to uh, advocate for, for what's necessary to protect the environment. So that's a very influential part of my life. Uh, because of my involvement with him, I decided to go to graduate school and, and went on the science path I've been on ever since. A little bit more history here. Uh, I was in the joint program between MIT and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for my PhD. I worked with John Teal, and primarily on, on salt marsh ecology. Teal is a notable salt marsh ecologist. And I did things like look at sulfur cycling, which led me into some acid rain research later. I looked at natural methane fluxes from this. Um, we'll come back. I've been fascinated with methane ever, ever since that work. And as I mentioned earlier, what I really want to spend the time on today is to tell you why methane is such a uh, undervalued uh, part of global change, but that's when I started thinking about it. Teal also encouraged me to work broadly on other issues, and, and he worked on other things among uh, on oil pollution, and there's been an oil spill there in the coast of Massachusetts in 1969, so when I started graduate school in 74, uh, there were still obvious ecological effects from it. The oil was still persisting, and in fact, the oil is still there today from that spill in 1969. But I, as a side project, got engaged in that and uh, developed sort of a lifelong interest in, in looking at activities. As one part of that, while I was still a graduate student, the, uh, after the oil embargoes of the mid-1970s, the federal government decided to open up much more of the continental shelf to offshore oil. And for the first time ever, they proposed to develop oil off the New England coast. Uh, what they called uh, OCS lease sale number 42, proposed in 1976. And I and a few other graduate students took on as a semester-long course the challenge of plotting through the environmental impact statement for that, which is a five-volume uh, tome of, of some uh, 6,000 pages or something like that. And we published a critique because it was based on absolutely terrible science. And... Uh, we got a fair amount of publicity for that publication, and I was invited to testify before the U.S. Senate on it. Uh, 
We were able to uh, work with some environmental groups who sued the government over it, and we actually won in federal court. Uh, one of the very few times ever where science uh, was able to uh, actually uh, force the government to come back on on an environmental impact statement and stop an action. So there still is no uh, soil development off of New England, and uh, our, our actions were part of that. Again, still in graduate school, there was a tanker that broke up off the coast of Massachusetts in a winter storm, but like the perfect storm, in December of 1976, and I was lucky enough to be part of the scientific uh, study that went out and tried to look at that. The little little ship up there is the research vessel we went out on, the Oceana. We weren't able to do any real science because it was too rough, and in fact, waves were breaking up over the entire ship. Uh, the captain resigned to his uh, commission at sea because he had sort of a nervous breakdown over his own ship safety. And, but it's sort of an eye-opener that uh, how little we know about oil pollution because it's typical that you uh, either have no before hand data or the conditions just don't make it possible to study, as was the case here. Jumping ahead a little bit in time, by this time I'd gotten my PhD and I'd worked in Woods Hole for a while as a staff scientist, but Cornell had hired me in 1985 as a professor, and along came the Exxon Valdez oil spill in Prince William Sound. Uh, at the time, it was the largest oil spill ever in the United States, and it remained the largest one ever until the uh, Gulf of Mexico BP blowout uh, four years ago now. Uh, the state of Alaska hired me to work with the uh, Attorney General's office. I was in charge uh, as a consultant while also still working for Cornell. I was in charge of their sort of quality control assurance for the research on what the effects were, uh, trying to make sure that any evidence we had would, would hold up in, in court. And that was uh, very depressing in some ways because it was a massive spill and you could see credible damage everywhere, and yet uh, it was almost impossible to prove that there was much damage. And we can come back and talk about that later if you like, because of the difficulty one faces in a real world after a disaster like that. How frustrating is it as a scientist to, to not be able to prove the obvious that's all around you? That, uh, again, sort of a major moment in my life. This is the last one in my background before I sort of jump up to the, some of the more current things we're working on. Slide number 10. I had another very interesting uh, opportunity in uh, Alaska. This was in 1993. And I was hired by Alaska Legal Services to be an expert consultant and help them in a uh, court case uh, that Native American tribes had brought against uh, ARCO, which later became British Petroleum, so one of the world's largest oil companies. They were concerned, they being the Native Americans, that offshore oil development in Norton Sound was destroying their environment, and so they wanted to put a stop to that. Uh, in fact, there had not been much ecological damage. We weren't able to find any at all. But we were able to get uh, subpoenas to go into the ARCO records, and we proved that uh, ARCO had been uh, lying to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, just falsifying. They're using illegal substances, which are uh, not allowed for drilling, discharging them into Norton Sound, and just completely fabricating records to EPA to cover that up. So the reason I tell you that story is that we proved that. Uh, we proved it before the case went to trial, and the resolution was that ARCO agreed to pull out of Norton Sound, relinquish other drilling rights, help make Norton Sound forever free of oil development, which it still is. Uh, but in exchange for that, uh, what we had found out was to remain secret for at least 10 years, until at least 2003, so that ARCO wouldn't have their reputation uh, be smirched as people who falsify uh, the pollution that they do. And that's very common to this day in the oil and gas industry. There's a lot of secret deals, secret uh, court decisions, et cetera, a real issue. Bob, um, on this slide, uh, just because some people, and it's a great slide showing the whole Alaska sort of um, uh, Russia and even into Northwest Territories. Tell the folks and give perspective where the Valdez spill was in, in uh, sure. relationship here. Yeah. And yeah, maybe use the Gulf of Alaska that down there in the picture and talk about where it is from there. 
the Exxon Valdez spill was, was in the uh, Prince William Sound, which is part, part of, it's off the Gulf of Alaska, as you say. It's the uh, largest huge bay-like area there uh, towards the uh, east in the main part of Alaska, so off the Gulf of Alaska. Norton Sound in this one is uh, much further uh, to the north and shown in, in red because it's a red king crab habitat in the particular map I happen to pick up, so much, much further north. Uh, wh one of the problems we had with looking at the Exxon Valdez spill is that there was absolutely no scientific study of what Prince William Sound looked like before the spill. So we went out there and you could see that there were, you know, marine mammals were hurting for sure. There were a lot of uh, dead sea otters which showed up. Did not find much in the way of other dead sea life because most things are eaten or decomposed right away when they're killed. Populations looked low, but there's nothing to compare it with because there's no pre-spill data. And so what you do if you don't have a, you know, before uh, event data is to look for some reference site or control site, something like Prince William Sound, uh, but not oil, to see how it behaves differently. And there is no such thing. Prince William Sound is a very unique environment. There's really nothing quite like it ecologically anywhere else. And so, although it was obvious that the area had been just slammed by the oil spill, uh, we were not able, in fact, to prove it in any uh, meaningful way. And it's part of the reason the court case over that is still not settled decades later, and that's part of the reason why. I thought it'd be great to give the perspective, so thank you. Before we go into your current work, which I really want to give you a lot of time to talk about, let me just ask you a few other questions here. Um, the, what does the term sustainability mean to you? And we ask this with, of all our guests because we get a wide variety of answers, yeah. and, <laughs> and it's, it's a term that I think is is, is interpreted differently. So, you know, when you hear it as it relates to your thoughts and definition of it, what, what does it mean? Well, you know, sustainability is a term that is so widely used now, and as they say, it means different things to different people. To me, if something is to be sustainable, if a society or an environment is to be sustainable, then it, it needs to, uh, to continue in, in its uh, you know, current trajectory without... Uh, serious degradation that's going to undercut the uh, uh, long-term longevity of that, but uh, not not everyone uses the term in, in that way at all. So uh, you know, it's, there, there are most universities at this point, ours for sure, have centers for sustainability, and uh, you know, a lot of, of what they research, I don't think, is necessarily making us into a a planet or a society that. Uh, going to have much of a long-term future at all. Oh, well, great. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that wasn't on the list, but I'll give you another little bit of commonality between us, a couple of names. So I, one of my mentors and during the same time that Dr. Teal was yours, and by the way, I, I never worked with him, but I knew of him. I was working in um, intertidal ecology in that 1973 time when I was a senior in college with a couple of professors at Irvine, Dr. Sibley um, and, and Dr. Lichter. Oh, yeah. and, okay. um, and then as I went to Scripps and beyond, um, my major prof um, became Dr. Uh, Falter, who his professor was Dr. Kitchell, who published the ecology text. And then I became really good friends with Dr. Hassler, who is the guy who published all the articles in Scientific American about homing behavior and pheromones and so on. But there's a couple of names that I think you might know of, at least, who became really great mentors. One of them is still so today, although he's ailing in health. They come from your area of the country. So Drs. Todd, well, actually, Dr. Todd, right. um, John Todd. And yeah, then John Todd pretty well. Right, and then Bob Rodale, um, yeah. so the guys who founded New Alchemy. Um, and so if you say you know John... Uh, that's great, and, and uh, I've spent a lot of time with John and, and also with his son Jonathan now, and, and as you may know, John, John's not in great health today, so hopefully, yeah. hopefully he gets a little bit better moving ahead here. So, yeah. um, Anyway, again, comparable comparable places, and it's, not a, it's probably not totally unlikely that we didn't run into each other at a conference somewhere along the way. I probably um, have. <laughs> So related to that, just because I brought up some names that meant something, and I'm, you know, maybe you're already going to tell us the name, but 
is there a person in the green movement, sustainability field, or an environmental area that's had a really profound impact on your life? Who is it? And tell us a little bit about why. And maybe you've already done that a little bit. With well, no, I've already alluded to it. I think probably George Woodwell would be the number one person. Okay. Yeah. George is a practicing scientist. He's still alive. He's uh, in his early 90s. He's uh, still uh, mentally healthy and active. Uh, he's not so active as a scientist anymore, but uh, he did a, a bunch of incredible science over his life. He was one of the people who really pushed uh, climate change on early. Uh, I did that internship with him in 1973 while well, in undergrad. After I got my PhD, I also did a postdoc with him and then worked for him as a staff scientist for quite a while, and I've kept in touch with him. And Part of my very first job was to help him teach a your institutional graduate class on climate change back in 1980 that we did with uh, Yale and Harvard and uh, MIT and a few other institutions for a month in Woods Hole. Uh, George also, uh, what did he do? He helped uh, on the band DDT movement. He did some of the pioneering work on uh, how radioactivity affects ecological communities. Uh, he's one of the people who helped found the Natural Resources Defense Council and Environmental Defense Fund, those sort of active organizations. So there are many other scientists who've been hugely uh, important in my life. Gene Likens, who helped uh, discover acid rain, would certainly be one. Dave Schindler, who is pioneering uh, whole ecosystem experiments on lakes to look at nutrient pollution and all, the, became a later mentor. Actually, after I was already a tenured associate professor, I started working with him, but uh, he helped influence a lot of my thinking since then. Well, those are all world-class names, and so that's that's really cool. Well, why don't you go ahead now and, and um, expand on your on your and your views on pollution from oil and gas industry, your your thoughts on global climate change, you know its urgency. I think it relates directly to your PowerPoint, and. Um, you know, and, and I thought a really exciting one, and, I, and, and either went, you know, weave it into the PowerPoint, or we can talk about it separately. Is the views that you've got on how the court system um, is is allowing confidentiality that the oil and gas industry uses to keep the public and and policymakers in the dark, which is something I just think our listeners ought to. Yeah, you know, no, I'd, I'd love to talk about that some more. I mean, hey, my first experience was with that Norton Sound case back in 1993, and, and I was horrified, but uh, I had signed a contract, you know, I was working for the Alaska Legal Services and the Native American Corporations, basically, and I signed a contract saying I would abide by their uh, rules of evidence, and, and what they did was to settle out of court for what they wanted, the, the Native peoples felt what they wanted, Norton Sound is protected, although no one in the world understands why, because it was all secret, but ARCO got what they wanted to do by covering up their, their trails. And, you know, was, we were lucky to be able to stumble on the, their files and, and find the, the extent of their distortion. I mean, for years, they've been falsifying records to the Environmental Protection Agency. And I suspect that the industry generally does that. Uh, an awful lot of the regulation of the oil and gas industry is for two government agencies, and there's very difficult to check the accuracy of that. So, if, if you look at the high volume hydraulic fracturing that's going on to get gas out of shale gas, this new phenomenon uh, that sort of exploded over the last five to ten years, if you look at what's going on, say, in Colorado, I'm sure, but also in Pennsylvania, I'm closer to the detail, there's plenty of evidence that uh, aquifers are being contaminated and things like that, but most of that evidence is is secret because again, uh, industry will work uh, out of court secret deals with uh, with individuals in order to solve their problems. So the public is kept in the dark. I I think it's a huge problem. Well, and let's um, segue into back into your presentation from that by just a brief little vignette from me. I was involved with a rancher in western South Dakota that ended up lasting almost 15 years. It ended up basically causing him to lose everything he had gained throughout his life financially because he was so committed to it. And it was actually never adjudicated. It was settled. The, the, 
the wildcatter that was involved ultimately did admit culpability. However, the details, again, were secret. I was an expert, so I can't even talk about those, obviously. But what I can talk about is the fact that this is a guy who worked his entire adult life to, to, to buy a ranch in western South Dakota where all he wanted to do is to, is to run cattle. And this was in 1979 and 1980. And he acquired the ranch. He came in and he, he took about 15 springs that had literally just sort of through the years stopped flowing. He brought them back to life. He, he brought cattle into the area. And then all of a sudden, one morning, he woke up and there were drilling. Wow. And he had, he had not realized that in the West, the United States, you know, mineral rights are held separate from property rights. And he didn't have the mineral rights. And these, this company was well within its rights to show up and do what they were doing. What they weren't within their rights for, and it actually involved fracturing. They were doing the early stages of fracking, was to do it improperly and to... And this, the oil found formation was called the Shannon and it was an eagle and it was a deep found, found a formation. The aquifer was the Fox Hills and it was more shallow. Basically through their fracking activity, they created a connection between the gas and the, and the aquifer with the water in it. And that gas was moving upward into the aquifer. The, the water was, was seeping downward. So two things happened. One, the springs dried up. And two, his water began to look like 7-Up, which ultimately yeah. ended up in an explosion that, that blew his house up. And then lastly ended up in what consumed uh, another 15 years of his life trying to win a case, and, which, like I said, ended up with him losing almost everything financially, but getting a victory in his mind because he did get this, this awareness. But again, most of it was not publicly known. So. Yeah. Anyway, so a good segue into your back to your PowerPoint. And what I'd like to do is to just uh, bring your audience up to speed a little bit on the, some of the latest information on climate change and then talk a little bit about methane and some of the work we've been doing on that. And I, I should say, you know, I've, I've talked about my earlier years on oil pollution in the oil and gas industry, and I mentioned that way back in my thesis work, I looked at some natural sources of methane. Most of the time, you know, the past couple of decades, I've been doing other types of research. We work on uh, coastal nutrient pollution and how it affects seagrass beds, and we work on the sources of nutrient pollution that cause the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico from the Mississippi River Basin and those sorts of things. But I've, I've always been interested in climate change. I've continued to teach climate change, and I've continued to think about methane. And so that's just sort of come together in some series of papers we've published over the last few years, and that's what I want to walk you through. So slide 11, and this is from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, from their last synthesis report, it came out just a, a year ago this month. And the IPCC has been an international body, part of the United Nations. They've been forging scientific consensus on uh, climate change uh, going back decades now, and every five years or so they put out a new sort of synthesis report. So this is their newest and, and latest one. And what this slide shows you is that the temperature of the Earth, average temperature is indeed rising, has been rising, and that each of the last uh, three decades has uh, been the warmest uh, ever in, in recorded history. And of course, you have to go back hundreds of thousands of years or more in order to find temperatures that are comparable. So, so climate change is real. It's with us. It's going on also from the IPCC report. And what I want you to look at is a busy little slide. I'll show you another aspect of it in a minute. Uh, but this is uh, what a climate scientist calls the radiative forcing, the amount of warming power that's coming from the various uh, gases and substances that human society puts into the atmosphere. And at the bottom is a summary of those radiative forcing. This is the uh, the heat trapping capacity of the atmosphere due to human increases in gases in the atmosphere. At three points in time, I, I was really struck when I saw this because the times they, they show are 1950, 1980, and then up to 2011, more or less the present. And 1950, of course, is more or less when you and I were born. And 1980 is when I taught uh, that first course on uh, climate change. And during that time period, the uh, radiative forcing of the atmosphere had already doubled due to human-caused pollution. And yet since 1980 until the, the present, you know, 
we haven't really done much to address climate change, and so it's doubled again, and uh, four times uh, higher now than when you and I were born back in the early 1950s. So, uh, pretty pretty rapid rate of change. It's just for people who are skeptical about whether humans are causing climate change. Uh, you should not be skeptical. Humans are causing climate change, and that's the those greenhouse gas emissions and that cumulative rating forcing that's uh, growing fourfold over our lifetimes. Uh, there are other things going on with climate. There's volcanic eruptions and changes in solar activity and things. So there are a lot of things controlling the, the planet's temperature. But what this shows is on the bottom there, the blue, what the temperature of the Earth would have been over time if humans had not been increasing greenhouse gases. And then the top shows a model of what happens when you throw in those greenhouse gas emissions. And, of course, that well matches up with the actual warming we're seeing. A lot of things are going on, but the warming we're seeing is driven by greenhouse gases. The planet would have been cooling over the last uh, 50 years or so otherwise. The major driver behind climate change is our addiction to fossil fuels. And you know, George Woodall is correct that things like uh, deforestation of the Amazon contributes, but they're not the biggest player. The biggest problem is our fossil fuel use, and we continue to use fossil fuels at an amazing rate, so clearly we have to break out of that if we're getting anywhere. And what I want to spend a little bit of time with you on now is how we break out of there, and there are two ideas I'm going to run with. One is the concept that natural gas, which increasingly means shale gas from hydraulic fracturing, but natural gas is somehow a bridge fuel that would allow society to continue to use fossil fuels and yet uh, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. And industry loves this idea. Some of the big environmental groups like the idea. President Obama uh, has promoted this idea. So we'll, we'll talk about that, and then I'll come back and suggest that the better way forward is really to move as quickly as we can to renewable energy. And the, the basis of this is that to get the same amount of, of energy from different fuels, produce different amounts of carbon dioxide. And this shows the amount of carbon dioxide as grams of carbon. You get a uh, megajoule of energy from natural gas, uh, diesel, or from coal. And natural gas, as the industry loves to tell you, is a clean burning fuel. So less carbon dioxide to produce the same amount of energy. And so the idea that a rich fuel uh, comes about we can convert from coal to natural gas. The president is actively promoting that at the moment as a solution to climate change for the country. Uh, not as radical as trying to move towards truly renewable sources. I first became familiar with this idea maybe about half a dozen years ago. Uh, I started paying close attention to it for five years ago as the shale gas revolution started to happen because of the shale gas is increasingly the source of natural gas, and I was just wondering if this really could be good for climate change. It didn't entirely ring true. And I think it's not true, and uh, the next slide starts to explain why. And it's methane. And I, you know, I've thought about methane ever since my uh, graduate school days, looked at some of the natural fluxes from wetlands, which, which can be significant. Uh, but natural gas, whether from conventional sources or shale, is mostly methane, 85, 90, 95% methane. Methane is the second largest, uh, second most important greenhouse gas behind carbon dioxide. It's actually over the times more potent in uh, absorbing infrared radiation and heating the planet per mass than is carbon dioxide. So it's a very potent greenhouse gas. Uh, and that means that even small methane emissions make a big, big difference. But what I want to show you again here on slide 18 is from the IPCC report. I showed you this slide a minute ago. Uh, focusing at the bottom. The top, this shows that currently carbon dioxide is, is the major source of global warming, uh, about 1.66 watts heat absorption uh, per square meter. But methane's pretty close at about one. It's not a distant uh, second in terms of its importance in global warming. Very important greenhouse gas. So what I and, and some other colleagues at Cornell did, notably Tony and Gracia, was to start to estimate how much methane is emitted, particularly from shale gas as it's developed, from conventional natural gas too, and all the way from drilling and the sort of leaks you were talking about before uh, to the 
processing of gas delivery to cities and you know, buildings blow up in cities now and then too. We, we clearly have gas leaks in cities. We estimated how much methane that is compared to, to carbon dioxide. We, we published a paper on this in uh, spring of 2011. And surprisingly, it was really the first time that anyone had published a comprehensive analysis of the role of methane leakage in the greenhouse gas footprint of shell gas. No one had looked at it. So promoting this idea that it's good gas from a climate standpoint, but without really looking at methane. We got a lot of pushback and criticism from industry. There's been a lot of science since then. Uh, I think our science has held up quite well, but rather than uh, boring you with all the details of that, I want to just show you a most recent summary that we published uh, just a few months ago with the most recent science from the IPCC report and the best and most recent estimates of methane leakage, what we're looking at is to compare the greenhouse gas footprint of natural gas uh, with diesel oil with coal. And the orange bars are the carbon dioxide emissions to get a unit of energy. And the red is the uh, methane component of that greenhouse gas footprint converted to carbon dioxide equivalent using the protocol of the IPCC. So if you ignore the methane, you can say, oh, yeah, okay, natural gas is a better fuel than these others from a climate standpoint. But if you include uh, methane emissions, it's not. It has a much larger greenhouse gas footprint, in fact. Uh, so we concluded that natural gas is not a bridge fuel. It's a, it, it's a bridge to nowhere. And I want to give you just a little bit of sense uh, of some of the politics since then. Uh, you know, I've, I've published about 200 scientific papers in my career, never with the sort of intensity uh, of, of feedback that this one got. Usually, you'd be lucky if 100 people read your paper over your lifetime. Uh, if people are going to write follow-up, it might take them years. In this case, there have been about 35 papers published that have commented on our paper since it was published three years ago, and many of those came out in the first three to four months, which is just really unfair. In a sort of orchestrated attempt to discredit us. Uh, it was held up pretty well, but uh, we did get a huge amount of pushback, a huge amount of attention. Just one way to illustrate this uh, over 1,400 newspapers covered our paper when it was first published within the first month. New York Times had it on the front page. And so Tony and Graffy and I were named as some of the runners up for Time People of the Year in 2011. Uh, not because we're good people, but because of our newsworthy, the newsworthiness of our paper. Just to prove that it has nothing to do with being a good person, and we can look at some of the other runners up here in persons of the year. Uh, you can choose choose your uh, favorite there, but uh, Vladimir Putin is there, Osama bin Laden are, are also some of the 50 runners up with Tony and Graffy and I. So it's all about newsworthiness. Anyway, huge amount of pushback from industry. Uh, they certainly continue to try and discredit me, but a lot of other scientists have gotten engaged, and the IPCC has a pretty good job of endorsing much of what we said at this point. And if you and your audience talking with me, I'd like you to remember this slide. I think it's uh, one of the most important slides I've seen in some, perhaps ever. It's a work by Drew Schindel, who was working for NASA Goddard Space Institute at the time. He's now a professor at Duke. Uh, he and colleagues published this uh, back in 2012. And what it shows the rate of warming of the planet over most of the 20th century, a jagged line up until 2011, and then some projections, and we can see the global warming here, and then four projections for what the planet might look like over the next uh, several decades into the future. And there are the yellow bar there, which they mean to highlight as a warning area, a red bar, which is an area of extreme heating. The worry is that if we get into those yellow to red areas, we may hit tipping points in the climate change, the climate system, and have some uh, runaway global warming that will be beyond human control. And the uh, many government agencies, the IPCC and other UN agencies, are now warning that we're on that trajectory based in part on, on this figure. Let me show you the four uh, scenarios there, which they, they cover. The first, the top one, is, is the reference scenario. That's if society continues to do as we're doing and not take any action to control climate change. And if we do that, we'll hit these dangerous 
temperature is within the next 15 to 35 years, that sort of time frame. The next slide down there, which says here uh, CO2 measures, is what will happen if society were to have started aggressively back in 2011 controlling carbon dioxide emissions but ignored methane and other gases. And because of lags in the climate change system, it really doesn't do us any good for the next several decades. It's, it's important to do that, but it doesn't do anything in terms of slowing the warming over the next, uh, say, 30 years or so. And we still will hit dangerous potential tipping point in the climate system in the time frame of the next 15 to 35 years, pretty, pretty soon. The bottom two lines are what aim and also a soot, what's called black carbon on this slide. And the climate change, the climate system responds much more quickly to those. So even if we ignore carbon dioxide, which we shouldn't, we need to control all gases, but we can slow the rate of warming significantly if we control methane emissions. So we need to do that in order to buy ourselves some time and, and uh, figure out how else to adapt to climate change systems. So where is methane coming from? Well, the number one source of methane in the atmosphere is, is the natural gas industry. So this idea of promoting it to somehow reduce carbon dioxide emissions is, is just uh, a really disastrous idea. Before you go on to the next slide, just because I know you, we hear this, we're out here in the farming west. So you mean to say that methane from natural gas is a bigger supply than from cows? There's uncertainty. These, these are the latest and, to my mind, best estimates of where methane's coming from globally in terms of uh, teragrams of methane per year, so 10 that are from the whole planet per year. Uh, we have natural sources. Some of those uh, wetland sources that I measured in my thesis are important but total natural sources are about 220 kilograms. Anthropogenic sources are bigger. Now, unlike carbon dioxide, where natural systems still have more influence than human sources, humans are dominating the, the methane change. And there's uncertainty in these numbers, but the number one, that's almost entirely the natural gas industry, your cows and all are number two, and not that far down there. That's the planet as a whole. In the United States, uh, the difference between natural gas and, and cows and animal agriculture is larger uh, simply because we, we're such an important part of the global natural gas production. And uh, so, you know, the, the message is we want to control methane emissions from both animal agriculture and from the natural gas systems. Those are the, the top two emitters. And, you know, how should we do that? Well, I would personally close down the natural gas industry as quickly as I could. And there are a bunch of things we could do to reduce methane emissions from cows as well. Changes in manure handling systems are the number one, but paying more attention to diet is, is also a useful thing to do. This slide is, is just to uh, illustrate one of the potential tipping points. As we start to warm the planet, as we've already warmed the planet, there are a variety of, of changes that are happening. But one of them is that we're changing Arctic systems. We're melting permafrost. The huge amount of organic carbon stored in frozen soils in the Arctic, and as we warm that, uh, we're releasing some of that as carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, accelerating that cycle. We're also producing a lot of methane from bacteria that do that naturally, but they wouldn't have been doing it naturally if we had not caused that warming of, of, the, of the tundra. It's just to demonstrate that this is happening. These are data pulled together by National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and what they show is that over the last uh, 20 years, lost almost 20% of the world's tundra. It's been warmed, the permafrost has, has melted, and we've converted a lot of that, some of it to forest, but a lot of it to wetlands, which will greatly increase that, that flux of methane and get into this sort of runaway spiral of warming. We're worried about two pictures of what's involved there. The upper left one is a particular area in Alaska taken uh, 20 years ago, and the one to the lower right is the same area taken more recently. Tundra has become wetland due to global warming over that time frame. And, and with that, there's a lot more increase in, in uh, those quote-unquote natural sources of methane. So I think uh, we have to reduce methane fluxes from human sources, natural gas, number one, let's get rid of that as a fuel. How do we move forward? I'll just uh, quickly sum up uh, why 
why I think we have an alternative. We've been working with Mark Jacobson as a professor of engineering at Stanford, and, and Mark's been thinking for a long time about how to transition the world to a completely renewable uh, future and do so fairly quickly. We worked with him to produce uh, two years ago a detailed plan on how to do that for the state of New York, and then this year we published a sequel on how to do that for the state of California. And let me just run through the plan very quickly. The plan is to uh, get rid of all fossil fuels, not just for electricity, but for vehicles and for home heating and for industry. Replace it with uh, renewable electricity and higher efficiency uh, uses of energy. The point I want to emphasize is that our plan calls for using only technologies that are commercially available today, and for the most part, uh, technologies that are economically feasible today. These are not extravagant ideas. So this is technically possible to get rid of fossil fuels. Largely by 2030, we estimate that it would cost about uh, $570 billion to do this for the state of New York, and, and that's a big number. But I'd like to point out that currently uh, we're spending uh, $33 billion a year in the state of New York on uh, deaths and health issues from people who are injured by air pollution from fossil fuel industries. So in fact, if we get rid of the fossil fuel pollution, uh, that alone would pay for this transition over 17 years. So it's affordable, huge increase in jobs, huge, uh, hugely good for the environment. The summary on that, just to show the, the time trajectory, we think it's technically possible and economically feasible in a way it's desirable for the state of New York to get rid of most fossil fuels by, by 2030 and then you know, take another 15, 20 years to finalize the plan, but, but we, we can move there pretty quickly. And when I've given talks on this uh, elsewhere and when I talk to politicians, people go, well, just not possible for any societal transition to happen that, that fast. So it's just to show a historical example of a transition which did happen that fast. And, and that's the change from horse-drawn carriages to automobiles in the United States. Basically, if you go back to 1900, 1910, this is a log scale. Uh, 1910, cars were making up uh, less than 1% of of transportation for people in the United States, overwhelmingly horses. Uh, Fifteen years later, cars were making up 95% of our, our transportation, and horses were on their, their way out. So you know, that was a, a massive transition that happened very quickly. The reasons for converting our energy systems are, are much more compelling than switching that transportation system. And I, I think it can be done. I think it, it must be done. So I appreciate the chance to be talking with you about today. And that's uh, what I wanted to say. This has been awesome, and, and I'd really like to even, like I said, do a follow-up with you just professionally and personally. And let me, Let's me let just end on this. First, everybody know that in two weeks we'll have another um, one of our, of our webinars, and, and please tune in again, and uh, if you can't be live, listen to replays. But would you tell us kind of to end here, what can, what can our listeners do? What can we do to help um, with, with making this transition as you ended your talk? What, and, and, and realize we have a lot of people that are in college now that are going to be listening. They're, they're looking to create their careers. We, we have interns that will be here over the next year that I know every one of them will have interest here, and they're going to want to know what can we do um, well, as we you move know, I ahead. I think there's a huge number of opportunities for people who are in college now or, or looking for careers into the future, you know, building this renewable energy technology, uh, making this revolution happen, and, and also the agricultural changes, which we need to make to, you know, reform how we how we grow cows to uh, make them healthier and reduce methane emissions. But uh, on the energy side of it, people focus on uh, solar installations and wind installations, and that's certainly an important part of it, but there's so much more you could do. It, it, you know, one of the low-hanging fruits is to replace the in-home use of fossil fuels, whether it be oil or natural gas, with modern high-efficiency heat pumps. And the uh, even if they're run on electricity that's coming from coal, their greenhouse gas footprint is far less than using oil or gas in a home. And the design that needs to be done to make that happen, the education, those things are cost effective. I mean, I've put a one heat pump that paid for itself in about 18 months and just 
economically to get my greenhouse gas footprint. Uh, I'm putting one in to completely make my own free of fossil fuels over this coming uh, fall, and I think the payback period there will be about seven and a half or eight years. But there's a lot of you know a lot of work involved in in getting that done. There's a lot of ignorance out there about how these things work. Uh, I just think there's a huge amount of opportunity for engineers and builders and policy people and lawyers, you know, rewriting some of the regulations to make this easier to do. Huge opportunity. Well, Bob, that's just awesome, and we really are coming up against it here. So I think I'll I'll um, say goodbye, and again, thank you so much for taking time out of your day and and helping us. Please, everybody, be out there. And Leanne usually takes about a day to get it edited, um, and Bob, again, she'll connect with you to make sure it's available for you. You can even talk to your students and others. To it's funny that speakers who they, they have it to their you know their local constituency and they enjoy it and they also get some laughs out of it too. You know they see people in a different different setting. Um, so you you know your grad students will probably be the toughest on you on it than anybody. Oh, but. Um, <laughs> But anyway, you're doing wonderful thing for the planet. That's one of the things we always talk about is is economics, which is what one of my friends, Dennis Weaver, coined that word, which is you know doing things that we can that make the planet better in a sustainable sort of way, and then showing people how they can uh, make a little money doing it, as we say. So the the synergy of ecology and economy, and here's a big one where. Um, Dr. Howard ended up by telling us some things that we could be doing. Like I said, I'd love to schedule another time, and we'll try to do that where maybe we focus on that that back end of this. I mean, there's lots of little things I would have asked you about. The the people up in Idaho were talking about, you know, the PV related roadways that we could be doing, um, solar roads, and just all kinds of things. And then I have two geothermal heat pumps that that I um, do all the electrical for a, a dwelling that we created, and there's just so many things we can be doing. So. Bob, we thank you so much. Appreciate it. We'll sign off to our audience here. Thank you so much for all that uh, you guys are listening, and we'll talk to you again in a couple weeks. Thanks, Bob. Thank all right. Bye-bye.